My name is Christine Mullen Kramer, and I have the joy, the pleasure, the privilege of serving as the Deputy Director and Chief Curator here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. You know, this is the only museum in the Smithsonian system and the only national museum devoted exclusively to the arts of Africa and its connections to the diaspora. And we're passionate about that. And we feel that Africa is and should be part of everyone's uh, experience, everyone's heritage, as the birthplace of humankind. We are connected to Africa and should be. And so we've got great exhibitions uh, throughout our galleries. And so when you get a chance, do go from uh, the, the third level down all the way up to our pavilion and see what we have on offer today. But we've got a great program uh, this afternoon, and we're very grateful that you ventured indoors from uh, the beautiful sunshine outside to join us uh, this afternoon for a fabulous uh, uh, PowerPoint and lecture. Uh, it's on Sailors and Daughters, Early Photography, and the Indian Ocean. Uh, you know, this program is part of a multi-year uh, and very exciting program for us called the Ge uh, Connecting the Gems of the Indian Ocean. It is uh, a collaboration between the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art and supported uh, by our, co our, our collaborators, uh, the uh, Sultan Kabu Cultural Center. It is funded uh, as a multi-year series uh, with a $1.8 million grant. So this means a major multi-year initiative that's really bringing Africa into dialogue with the wider world. And that's something that our exhibitions and programs are, you know, try to foster in every way possible. And so we're very grateful to the Sultan Kabu Cultural Center, very good colleagues, uh, and I'm also very grateful to the leadership that Nicole Shivers from our education department and ably assisted by uh, Glenn Ojeda, also of our education department, uh, who have contributed to this uh, initiative. We have lots of things that have already happened in connection to this program and lots of exciting things to come. And so keep uh, track of the uh, activities of our GEMS project and uh, just uh, you know, uh, connect with our website to see what else we have on tap. Um, I bring you warm greetings from our director, Dr. Janetta Vegkol. Knowing Janetta as I do, she dearly wants to be in two places at once, and she continually strives to do so. Somehow, I think, she has achieved that today, uh, because we will have a video welcome by our illustrious director, Janetta Vegkol. But before I do, let me just extend a warm welcome to Dr. Erin Haney, a very good colleague of our museum. She is our research associate here at the museum, someone who has a long history with our museum, but also a very formidable presence in the history of African photography. And so we're delighted that she served as guest curator uh, for the web exhibit that is on our website. Uh, she will be introduced more fully by Nicole Shivers, but we know that we're very glad to see Erin uh, here at our museum, and I know that you're going to learn so much uh, about photography uh, and its context, its global context, through the scholarship of Erin Haney. So I was instructed to turn off the mic, which I will. So Good afternoon. I'm Johnetta Betch Cole. I serve as the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. I really wish I could be with you today on this historic and her historic occasion. I can't, but I want to assure you that my spirit is right there. To be a part of this moment when for the first time ever, our museum launches an online exhibition. Sailors and Daughters, Early Photography from the Indian Ocean World. Today you will also see a film. We will screen for you African Lens, the story of Priya Ramraka. Now the exhibition was commissioned by our museum 
and it is ably and brilliantly curated by Dr. Aaron Haney. How is all of this possible? It's possible because of the generosity of the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center in Washington, D.C. We were so privileged to receive a $1.8 million grant that allows us to do multi-year programming about an amazing connection between Zanzibar and East Africa and Oman. I want to express my deepest appreciation, not just for myself, actually, but for all of my colleagues, our appreciation to the Sultan Caboose Cultural Center. But I also want to thank my colleagues who have made today's program possible, who have done really impressive work and will continue to do impressive work in this multi-year programming. I have to lift up, give a sincere shout out to Nicole Shivers, who is the project lead for this exceptional programming. Nicole is ably assisted by our colleague, Glenn Ojeda. You know, I also want to thank you. I want to thank each of you because you chose to be in our museum today, to be a part of a worldwide experience. Because what you will see today in this priceless online exhibition can be and will be seen around the world. Enjoy every moment of this historic and her story. Okay. Good afternoon. I am Nicole Shivers, project lead for the Connecting the Gems project. And we're happy to be here today. I think Erin and I can attest to the journey has been getting this website up. It's been a great learning experience um, on patience and collaboration, but we're so grateful that all of you came out today to listen to her. So Erin Haney holds a MPhil and PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. She is a founder and co-director of Resolution, an organization focused on expanding access to photography and archives in Africa. She has taught and lectured in the US and UK and partners in a number of international research collaborations, including the pioneering photo preservation workshop 3PA in Porto Novo, Benin in March 2014. She writes widely on historical and contemporary artists, photography and art institutions, including the survey Photography in Africa. Erin is research associate in the Faculty of Art Design and Architecture at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa, and at the Smithsonian Institution. She teaches at George Washington University and University of Maryland. Please give a warm greeting for Dr. Haney. Thank you so much to Nicole. Thank you everyone for coming on a warm day, fighting the crowds. I know you can be outside doing lots of very nice um, forms of fun and the sunshine, but instead you're here and I'm really grateful to see everyone. Um, I know some, hopefully some more people will be joining us and, and thank you for um, bearing with us uh, during all of the disruption. Um, thank you especially to Nicole Shivers for commissioning the online exhibition and for the support of the Sultan Caboose Cultural Center. It's been a real pleasure to work with her on Sailors and Daughters. And Nicole's efforts um, to bring new audiences into museums um, are really at their core about liberating the museum, I think, so the best of what museums have to offer can escape the walls and sort of overflow their boundaries. And I think that this show is another effort to do um, precisely, precisely that. 
uh, my partners on the project are Xavier Corrubla, who assisted immeasurably with the exhibition, um, research and web design, uh, not to mention his expertise on, on the area, um, having grown up in the DRC. Um, I also need to thank our fantastic web designers, Gene Wilcox of Wilcox Design in Cambridge, Mass., and Doug Green of Green Interactive in Virginia. I also would like to thank Glenn Ojeda, um, Lenisa Kitchener in Education, and to Janet Stanley of the Warren Robins Library here at the museum, uh, Amy Staples of the Elliot Ellis Hoffman Photographic Archive, um, whose collections were central to this exhibition and project, uh, and also to Nathan Sowery, uh, Hakima Abdul Fattah, David Hogg of the um, Sackler Freer Archives, Mix Grove, Lisa Van, Mike Briggs, and all of the staff here at the museum for their um, contributions in support of this exhibition. And to many people, um, especially at Northwestern University, David Easterbrook, Esmeralda Kale, Wendy Grossman, Dabney Haley, um, and many, many others. I'm very grateful. This is a huge project, and I, I couldn't have done it without all of this collaboration. So um, I'm going to just sort of walk through and touch upon some of the things that I hope um, will lure us in further a little bit more to the, the exhibition um, and really s sort of try and talk about some of the impetus for it. Sailors and Daughters began with the concern to feature early photography from East Africa, coming from the archive and library collections uh, of this museum. And from there, the project grew quickly. Uh, Xavier and I soon realized the possibilities of this, of extraordinary photography and related work, which was almost completely unknown and uh, barely studied about or written. And on the other hand, there was so much material that signals a particularly colonial view um, and we wanted to disturb and upset those kinds of image fictions. And so the challenge became how really to do this for photographic collections that appeared initially to be predominantly commercial and touristic images. Um, so when learning, uh, here we go, when learning more about the early photographers who were working in this region, what we find out resonates very much with what we know about uh, the early history of photography in other parts of the world. And that is that early photography in East Africa and the larger Indian Ocean world are resolutely the products and imperatives of movement. It was the mobility of photographers and the wide realm of their audiences that situates the photographic modernities from the 1870s. So these photographs that we're going to be seeing are the creative collaborations between photographers, their subjects, their patrons, and us the global audiences, um, past, present, and future. And as such, these unfold across an extraordinary um, span of space and time. So Sailors, the Do uh, Sailors and Daughters, the title, I hope evokes that fundamental premise of movement of people and ideas and the technologies that traverse the Indian Ocean world. Um, and this is nothing new. People and goods have traversed the Indian Ocean over thousands of years connecting the communities and cities of East Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, the Far East, and Europe. In this exhibition, I've also tried to gesture to the gendered and social statuses implicated in the movements of these, of these uh, of people and of the photographs and, and the statuses of people um, that we now find in, the, in those photographs. And finally, um, I would emphasize that this is just really a starting point for a larger photographic and visual history um, of the diverse communities of the Indian Ocean, for which some terrific work has already been done, um, but very little on photography in particular. So, um, I'm just going to go. Um, so, um, one of the things that we wanted to do, I'm gonna sort of scroll down here, this is, you'll see the map of um, Zanzibar town, and we're gonna see more of this as we go. Um, and there's more sort of text here, which you can see. Um, and what we tried to do was give portions of the map of Zanzibar town, which um, may be of particular interest to you, or maybe something with, for, with which you're completely unfamiliar. But um, just to give you a sense of the sort of people and landscape that's happening, I'm going to, I actually do have an aim for this. I'm going to scroll over to um, a couple more. One of the things that we wanted to do was connect photography with the locally observed and felt senses of the changing landscape. 
Zanzibar became an important hub of photography from the 1870s. And photography really grew up with Zanzibar's modernization. So we featured images that mark the dramatic changes that Zanzibar town in particular were happening with the decline of slavery from the 1890s and the shifting political struggles. Zanzibar town was in many ways completely divided by class. It was a capitalist center um, with a few haves and many, many have-nots. Um, so the western coast, along the western coast that we saw earlier of uh, Stonetown, uh, you know, which we now think of as a, a protected UNESCO site, um, if we search for images of Zanzibar town, what we come up with are these beautiful coral um, and stone buildings. Um, you know, and they really have become a site of nostalgia and fascination because it's the architecture that's really built for, for royalty and for the merchant kings and queens and the land-owning elite. Um, so across the lagoon, uh, let me see if I can go back up. So here's the town, right? And then here is this lagoon. This lagoon has since been filled in. Uh, it was filled in by the Brits in uh, 1897 or something like that. So this area is downtown, but it's sort of built up of architecture. And then across the way is Ngambo, which was known as Swahili for the other side. Um, that referred to this land across the lagoon that was populated primarily were slaves, um, but who in the 1890s became free. Um, and so it was these people who had worked in the, cl the clove plantations that uh, predominated on the rest of the island. And so we have the layout in this case, and we've really tried hard to feature this, um, the layout and the houses built by people who were brought to Zanzibar as slaves from the East African mainland and as far away as um, southern and central Africa. And so we have really tried to, um, to draw out and focus these rare images that are, you know, that are much harder to find not only of the historic stone towns, but also of Ngongo. Um, and so it's through the work of Zanzibar Photo Studios that we can explore some of the facets of this town. Um, you know, we have, uh, let me go back a little bit. We have these um, modernist palaces and limestone and coral, which were commissioned, let me show you uh, these, um, commissioned by Bargash bin Said, um, one of the sultans who uh, ruled in the 1870s, and the expanding infrastructure of international trade. We also have the markets and neighborhoods of you know, the sort of more everyday people and the less documented parts of town. A.C. Gomez was the first photographer to set up there, and before that, he had established a studio in Aden, Yemen, um, and then came to Zanzibar. And then he was later joined in business by his son, um, and then they expanded again onto Mombasa in uh, what's now Kenya. And then the Coutinho father and son business were other important studios whose works um, we are starting to finally identify and um, you know inventory and sort of create a, a sense of their, their larger oeuvre of early East African photographers who were not um, who were all definitely and certainly part of this um, international milieu that were always traveling. Um, so there's lots left to do to give proper credit to the, um, to the region's cosmopolitan um, photographic practice of the early, 18th, uh, early 19th and 20th centuries. So I will let you browse that a little bit later. Um, um, so that's one important start, working from Zanzibar, but it's actually just one in the sort of constellation of migrations of people and photographs. One important tie to Zanzibar is, of course, Oman and the, the Sultanate of Zanzibar, which was established there after they moved from Muscat, Oman, in 1833. And it was the Sultan Said, Said, Said who moved his residence in the capital to Zanzibar um, but the long-standing ties between places extend much further back. Um, and in this section, we'll see these very, very early photographs. Why is this not coming down? There we are, sorry. Um, we see these very, very early photographs um, from Oman that, that, that the influences and the flows of people between Oman and Zanzibar um, were intensive, and they were built up over the centuries. Um, Muska, you can see, this is, this is actually so resonant with another image that we have of the market and sort of seaside in, uh, in Zanzibar, 
Um, and here, this is Muscat, and we see people that are clearly, you know, recognizably um, from East Africa, from the Horn of Africa. Um, and Muscat, of course, was this key maritime oasis, and it was a cosmopolitan city. And it served as a hub for people coming from East Africa and the Horn who were traded, and then they were absorbed by families and then became part of that significant African diaspora that went to the Middle East and to India. So we have many, many stories that are evoked here. Um, and it's my hope that, you know, in looking at these kinds of images very carefully, um, they open up more questions for our viewers than, um, you know, than we may have ever imagined if we, if we hadn't brought these together. And these come from the Ethnographic Museum in Germany. Um, Um, so the flows of people over time leaving the African continent and landing somewhere besides the Americas is probably unfamiliar to most of our American audiences. Um, there are so many aspects of movement, though, of um, Africans to Persia, uh, today Iran, for example. So again, people aren't referred to as slaves here. Um, this is a gradation of language and formality and sort of um, appropriate action when referring to people as servants or, or slaves or uh, the absorption of people as uh, family members. Um, and in the East African diaspora, people were traded as slaves from Zanzibar to Muscat and then in this case to Tehran, where they ended up in wealthy families as servants and trusted members of the household. And we're fortunate here to feature not um, just one, but Sorry, my mouse isn't working. But two uh, photographs um, taken by Antoine Sadrudin, uh, where we can get a glimpse of East Africans who were living in Persia. And for me, these are really a kind of hidden history, and getting to the and we're getting to the point now where the presence of East African and, and the African diaspora in this region is is getting to be accepted. But even the terms of language um, trip that up a bit. Um, in this case, we have a group portrait of Nasser al-Din Shah, uh, Shah Kahar um, with several of his personal attendants. And we see in this mix of uh, men several people from East Africa and the Horn of Africa who were his personal attendants. They were the royal eunuchs who were um, tr so trusted to this Shah in particular that they were his most prized advisors. And they became powerful and wealthy landowners. Um, and then above, we have an, and so, that's the sort of nice feature of this, which I'm trying to show you. And again, you know, with the extraordinary detail of these um, albumin prints, we, we can try and sort of zoom in and explore. But we see uh, this figure here in the center. Um, you know, this group came together to celebrate Rosa Kani, um, a recitation of Quranic texts on an important holy day. So again, you know, this assemblage of people, of women, men, uh, different classes and different um, different origins of people, and again, just bringing up questions, particularly um, for those of us who might not have even imagined um, that history of African uh, diaspora. Um, you know, I hope opens our eyes to to new new material and new images here. Um, the Monsoon Dao, so Northwestern University's um, Africana Library holds one of the most important collections of early photography from East Africa. And sadly, much of it is completely devoid of documentation, which makes featuring it very, very tricky. Um, but we won't find out more about it until it starts to circulate more broadly in the world, um, I would argue. Uh, so there are hundreds and hundreds of unexpected treasures uh, in this collection. And one of these was an album of Dao, some of which are featured here. Dao's are, um, you know, as probably many of you know, the primary mode of transportation and mobility across the Indian Ocean. And Dao is a Swahili and English word that describes um, a huge range of boats on the Indian Ocean, from small fishing vessels uh, to the famous huge crafts, which were made of wooden planks that were literally sewn together um, with rope. They were stitched together. And those enormous crafts sailed all the way from East Africa to China. Um, it's an extraordinary thing if you, um, and there's lots of information on it, and I've tried to draw attention to that on our resource page as well. Um, just if you're into boats or if you're not, <laughs> they're really, really extraordinary. And I'd also like to mention Abdul Sharif's um, extraordinary work that 
um, put together really beautifully um, the case for the complexity underlying images like these. Um, that the sciences and arts of navigation, astronomy, boat building, and navigation of the sea could not have happened without these transoceanic exchanges. So for example, sailing across the coast required the knowledge of currents and the land, but crossing the ocean, crossing that Indian Ocean required the expertise of a navigator, or Mualim, who navigated these routes according to the stars. Something that Chris has worked on with the Cosmos book. Um, so let me see, let me make sure. So we started with that map on the very first page, um, which really helps us understand and try to comprehend a little bit of those vast distances here. And the direction of the monsoons is critical here. Um, uh, the direction of the monsoons is critical here. I'm sorry, it's not responding. <laughs> I'm really trying to get it to work. Okay, so here we have the direction of the monsoons. Um, those monsoon seasons determined the direction which the Dows could go. So sailors were coming across from all over and they traveled so far but then they had to wait for the seasonal direction and when to shift. So that meant that sailors left their home, went across the ocean, and had to stay in another port city for months at a time until the wind changed again. So in effect, what this means is that the sailors, the traders, the travelers, having different hubs and different homes on the Indian Ocean's many ports all along this coast were polyglot. They would often marry somebody whose origins were very different from, from theirs. And this was happening over thousands of years. So these sailors and traders accumulated many hometowns, many senses of belonging over the course of one's life. So that was, that was their life. And it's this kind of cosmopolitanism that isn't really recognized as such, um, but it becomes easier to piece together and account for them and their movements as part of the human condition here. Um, and that reminds us also that globalism is really absolutely nothing new. Um, okay, so the Dows also bring to mind the migration of Indians to the Seychelles, Mauritius, and other East African ports. Amitabh Ghosh wrote so beautifully about this in Sea of Copies, um, the migration and the political and economic forces of the British Raj and the opium demand that pushed Indians to migrate to East Africa. Um, these records, going back in chronological time, are extraordinary, coming from the British records of uh, the administration, their administration in the Seychelles. Um, these are photos of the so-called liberated Africans. Um, from around the 1860s, on the, the British Navy pursued slaver ships that were leaving the East African coast and were headed toward Asia and toward the Middle East. And they took these people that were recaptured from these slaving ships, and they took them to Port Victoria in the Seychelles, where they were freed, so-called, by installing them as indentured servants on the French-owned and Creole-owned plantations there in Seychelles. So the British Navy um, got money for each person that they, that they freed and recaptured, basically. Um, so they used that to fund their own activities, essentially putting people that they, they were saying, you know, they were freeing from slavery, but essentially putting them back into a, another form of slavery and calling it liberation. So what's striking about these early photographs is um, that they're recorded with names. Um, they were renamed, oh sorry, um, they were renamed as they were recorded and photographed, you know, as, as part of this processing once they got to this port. Um, but their parental names were also recorded, I don't know if you can see. Um, so there is some fragment and some kind of acknowledgement of their former status and their former identity, and at the same time that attempt to direct their future status and their new names. So one question for me these extraordinary things raise is, is it a portrait if it's a person taken against their will at a moment of duress? Um, people continue to debate these questions. Um, what do we see in their faces? What of these you know, pictures can surpass the conditions that they were in at the moment. Um, so these photographs are, are, are fragments of this essential record that we need to know about 
Um, they provide a valuable record of individuals who existed and thrived under harsh conditions. And so for me, images like these ultimately defy and alter our expectations of precisely what constitutes a portrait. Uh, Charles Guillain traveled extensively along the East African coast to map out strategic ports and French holdings. This is an enormous book um, that's held in the collection. It's probably this big. It's a huge folio. Maybe some of you know about it. But it's <coughs> this tall and this big. And we had the whole thing digitized and then tried to figure out a way to make it legible and readable on a, on a website. So we couldn't incorporate all of the images, but we did our best to to give you a sample and a taste and um, more extensive records of those books um, in their complete form are also available online. Um, but they are a compendium of maps, images, landscapes, and portraits um, that are collected in this book uh, created in 1848 called uh, Voyage à la Côte Orientale d'Afrique. And these are lithographs, as, as you can see, based on some of the very first daguerreotypes ever made in East Africa. So these are extraordinary, extraordinary um, images. And when you see it, you're just sort of blown away by um, you know, the extravagance of bookmaking, especially in the digital age, to be able to see these and to be able to zoom in, which we try to do, and maybe not as successfully as we would have liked, but we certainly tried <laughs> to do that so we could explore it visually as much as it's possible. Um, I also recommend coming to the museum and just checking out these books in person because they will be <coughs> away. Um, uh, hold on, I'm just trying to get Let's see. So, um, um, the portraits that I'm trying to find here. Um, revealed the diversity of people who were coming from Central and East Africa and then were living in the coastal cities such as Ras Hatun, Mogadishu, Zanzibar, and Mombasa. So we see them and then we see the cities that they were living in and some of the prominent traders from East Africa and also from further afield. And I like the complexity of I like the complexity of some of these portraits. They force us to look very, very hard, especially when we deal with uh, Guillain's text, uh, which was part of the volume. Um, so these portraits initially appear, hold on, let me find the one that I'm looking for here. Um, these are portraits initially appear as um, kind of intimate and respectful. Um, but I suspect that actually the moment of photographic encounter was far more ambiguous and fraught. Um, Guillens convinced uh, his Swahili translators and negotiators and traders and their families to sit for the camera. And he wrote about those moments and how they were sort of widely observed by bystanders. But also we see that the rules of Muslim piety uh, restricted Guillens conversations with women. And so it was their husbands, this is what I wanted to show you. Um, it was their husbands and masters who compelled most of these depicted women and servants to sit for the photographer. Um, so we see some people with, you know, is it duress? You know, what's happening here? And he, you know, did try and write about it, the photographic, you know, the setting up and how long one had to sit for a photograph, a daguerreotype especially. You know, it was quite a long time and, you know, um, you see different levels of comfort with it. But we also see um, uh, that, you know, there's there are pictures in, like uh, one of the little girl, Aziza, who's the niece of the governor. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to find it. And uh, it was her, she was dressed up, well, I, I'm not able to find it, I'm sorry. But basically, she was dressed up, decked out in all jewels, this little eight-year-old girl. She has gold and sort of beautiful um, cloth and everything everywhere. Um, she had been adorned by the women in her family for this photographic portrait. And it was upon seeing this and seeing the result of the daguerreotype that the governor of Zanzibar decided he could also decide to sit for the, for the, um, for the uh, camera and for Gila. 
So, um, I would also like to point out briefly here, so Javier Corbuza wrote beautifully about uh, a lot of these images in detail, um, and it's captured in some of the blogs, the Smithsonian blogs, um, with the library and with the Sackler career. Um, I'm going to end with uh, Swahili Post Daughters. Um, and this last section that I'm showing you um, is another that I find full of surprises because there's so many so many things happening here. One is the fundamental uncertainty around which many of these images are taken. So we know that royal, uh, Zanzibari royalty and elite were early proponents of photography, and they had lots of photographs and carte de visite, including many of the European royalty and visitors at the time. In 1883, Sultan Bargash bin Said, the great modernizer, created a camera obscura room in the tower of one of his new palaces, in the high tower of one of his new palaces, called the House of Wonders. So he was interested in it. I mean, it really defies and sort of um, complicates our expectations that the Islamic world you know, had a decree against photography and against um, creating images of the human form. And there are lots and lots of literature, some of which I've also alluded to on the resource page, about um, Islamic scholars weighing in on the topic of photography and what what uh, you know what sorts of things should be expected of a photograph and how it might be different than other works of art. Um, so I refer you to that there. Um, turn of the century, Zanzibar uh, studios photographed royals and elites, and they also did a, a screaming business in, in portraits. Um, of temporary residents and, and visitors there. So some of these that we're seeing are commissioned portraits, and some of them were some kind of arrangement between the photographers and the subjects, which weren't commissioned, and probably you know were, were designed for commercial aims. So we have postcards, which are leaping from the private realm to the public realm. We have photographs that were mass produced as postcards and souvenir images, like uh, many that we're seeing here. Um, Many of these women were wearing expensive clothes, um, stylish new congos, you can see here, that were constantly being updated, uh, jewelry. Um, let me go to this one. Oh, no, I can't get the whole thing. <laughs> um, anyway, look online. Uh, Wapambe um, is something, is a class of women who were the servants or slaves of a very wealthy family um, I suspect that this is a portrait of two Wapambe. Um, the, the premise of this um, group of people was during festivals and holy days, the women who were part of the family needed to stay behind uh, the walls. They needed to be sort of secluded, and it wasn't done for them to be um, seen in public. And so the men were out enjoying the festivals, and then there were women who were the sort of servant class who were decorated again to the hilt in the you know extraordinary textiles, imported jewelry, all the rest of it. And they danced and performed and were a, a sort of visual um, uh, form of entertainment and beauty and enrichment to the, to the whole proceedings. Um, and so I suspect that these um, beautiful women were, were two of those women who sort of stand in and represent the, the, um, the royal women of the family. Um, but have a very different social status, which does not take away from this extraordinary beauty. It simply complicates greatly the reception of this photograph, right? Um, let me go down to one which everybody loves, Arab ladies. Um, so around the time of, uh, well, let's see, let's go back. So Arab ladies, um, in harems, I'll just point, I'll point this out to you. We have people that were coming to the harem of the, the royal court in Zanzibar from all over the place, from what is now Georgia in East, East Europe, from the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, down through Southern and Central Africa, India. People from all over were coming, uh, were brought to enter into the harem as concubines and as wives. Once they did this, they had two or three days to discard the clothing uh, and the dress style from which they came and to adopt the new style of dress which showed their um, membership as a, as a concubine or as a, as a wife of the sultanate's harem. And so what we see are Mirinda pants, 
Uh, these are called Miranda pants, and you see them here too. The sort of very tightly tailored trouser with um, a, a flared um, uh, ruffle at the bottom that sort of, you know, you can imagine it as somebody's walking, sort of flaring and moving beautifully. You have these extremely ornate congas, which would go out of style every two or three months. They had to be constantly updated. You have the kalemba, this um, uh, uh, very elaborately um, tied and wrapped uh, turban that women who are Muslim needed to cover their heads. So this was, you know, another uh, extremely ornate um, version of uh, head covering. And of course, there are many different styles of this. And in this woman, a lot of people have asked me about it. It's almost like she has bindi dots, but she has three of them as, as makeup adorning her face. So again, we don't know. I imagine that this one was almost certainly a commissioned portrait of, of a woman from the harem. Um, and then other ones could have been commissioned and then ended up as postcards. So again, going back and forth between the private and public realm. But I mean, that clash of, of cultures and the sort of senses of um, changing your clothing and retaining and changing your old identity and what must have happened in those spaces is, um, you know, it's, it's sort of mind-boggling. And then there are also people like Emily Reuta, who uh, was a princess of uh, the Sultan of Zanzibar and wrote and lived uh, in Zanzibar 1850 to 1870. Then she married a German, escaped, and went to Europe and wrote her autobiography, which is fascinating because she's talking about life in the court and then she's talking about her reception and her children in mid-19th century Europe. It's fascinating, and there are lots and lots of um, sort of examples of it. There's only one that I can think of like this, but there's a huge um, possibility for the literature and in also the, um, the oral histories and the songs. You know, there is an extraordinary oral and literary culture um, in this part of the world that sort of get at some of the senses of women, you know, going to a place and trying to figure out how they're going to make their way there and the, the things that they sort of have to go through. Um, so finally, one last thing that I'll, I'll point out. Um, during the time of abolition in 1897, um, I would say that this is a big turning point for photographers. Um, the demand for touristic images of Zanzibar's legendary be beauties, posed and smiling, coincided with that moment of when newly freed women began to dress and adorn themselves in ways that were previously forbidden. So as women were brought as slaves to Zanzibar, they, uh, they um, became Muslims. Uh, but if you belonged to somebody else, you were not allowed to cover your head. But that was a sign of a respectable woman. So once abolition happened, almost immediately, people started to wear, um, uh, to cover their heads and to wear congas and to buy congas, even if it was a huge proportion of their income, because that was basically a, a huge shift in status that, that was accessible and attainable to them. Um, and so that is sort of documented right with the, um, the rise of uh, photography and the possibility for more and more people to have their photographs taken. And then at the same time, the rise of this um, tourism and demand for commercial images of these places. So um, the photography expansion really included the wealthy people and poor people, aristocratic people and newly freed. And it's possible to read these poses you know, in one way or another as assertive, as, you know, as um, you know, full of assurance and even playfulness. Um, and we really need to know more. There are lots of secrets here, I think, but they are um, an extraordinary trace of the island's untold histories. Um, so I think, really, just to summarize, I think a lot of um, the most important information and sources for this kind of work really come from family collections and, uh, and, re and doing research into those kinds of things. I've done a lot of work, similar work, uh, in West Africa around mobilizing and preserving and gathering research on the photographers through those family collections, um, because they don't really exist in the same way in institutional collections um, and in museum collections. They really are in private hands. And I suspect that the work that could be done, um, not, not just here, not just in D.C. or Zanzibar, but all around those Indian Ocean communities, is a promising direction um, that I would like to be, um, that I can imagine being taken up by scholars and by the community members themselves. So I have a, a um, I would like to ask you, um, you know, are there any questions? You know, are there any comments? Um, rather than 
and going going in that direction to some ways right now. Mm -hmm. I know in Latin America, uh, some of the first photography was um, by Europeans and North Americans. In, in the case of uh, this area, or in the, um, well, all of these countries we've been discussing, are the um, photographers mainly outsiders, Europeans? And then uh, at what point did uh, photo studios begin to open up in, the, in those countries? No, it's a good, it's a really good question, and the question, and um, it's complicated, right? We have the names of some of these people that almost certainly are from the Portuguese diaspora, but there were people who were of Portuguese extraction living in Goa, for example, for centuries, right? And there were, we know there's a big influx of, of Goan people down to the East African coast, um, but we have nothing that, we even have one photograph of one of the photographers, um, and it also became clear that there were a number of East Africa, uh, sorry, Indian photographers who were coming and, and residing and working on the East African coast. And that seems to be the case more because of the kind of colonialism that happened and the kind of rule where, whereby, um, you know, for example, the royal families on the Seychelles and Mauritius and Madagascar and a lot of these places were the first people to set up studios and become photographers. They were absolutely local. They were high, you know, they weren't of the people, but they were local. Um, and for Zanzibar and Aden and a lot of these other cities, we, sim we simply don't know. What I have found with my research in West Africa is you find somebody with a German name or a Danish name or a British name, and they are local, and their families have been there for six or seven generations. So the presumption has always been that somebody named Luderat was not a Gold Coast or a Ghanaian photographer. He was a German or a Danish photographer. And when you start to do the research, you find out actually it's the reverse. These are mixed race. These are um, you know, mi uh, mi uh, communities that have been sort of hybrid um, for centuries in, in certain cases. And certainly the situation is very different in East Africa. But you have a lot of those cities where the cosmopolitan has been happening for so long that we can't really pin it down and say, you know, more, more so. I, I do think that the internationalism is the point that I, um, is my way of getting around it until further research is done. So. I don't really need a mic, but I'll use it anyway. <laughs> Erin, thank you. This is really wonderful. I've followed this in its various stages along the way, and it's really exciting to see it all come to fruition, so congratulations on that. Um, as a photo historian myself, I am very excited about the opportunities for using this resource. Um, needless to say, in conventional histories of photography, there is nothing coming anywhere close. And this opens a real opportunity to engage my students, to give other other students opportunities, you know, when we're looking for research topics. And, exactly. and obviously there are a lot of people to you in the near future. Um, but so, um, actually, two questions that I had was about the Charles Gilan images that were lithographs based on the daguerreotypes. Mm -hmm. Do we know where the daguerreotypes, original daguerreotypes are? Two of are? them, yes, are in Cape Ron Lee. They're very destroyed and almost impossible to look at. I think there are four or five remaining, and they were in a show um, of so-called first photographs. Um, so there are a few that exist, and of course, they are quite different. The background has, has been you know, transformed, a little bit that we can tell, and certainly the, back, uh, you know, the backdrop and the um, the, what do you call it, the things that held a person's head in place yeah. so that they wouldn't move, um, have been erased as they often are in, in lithographs of the time. But a few are definitely at K. Romley. I don't know about the rest of them. Maybe they'll show up in another private collection. Well, are any of them in condition enough to replicate in? I mean, gear types are impossible exactly. anyway. Yeah. Right. right. But I think, you know, in terms of as a, as a Photo historical lesson to understand right. the concept of the daguerreotype and its translation into lithographic. Be yeah. nice to have some information about Definitely, that. yeah. No, I, I, there is definitely the one exhibit that I referred to at Cape Ron Lee, but I, I can't remember the title of it. But it actually may even be in the um, in the resources page, um, which I won't. I'll, I'll try and look at that with you a bit later. Okay. But yeah, no, there the, there are definitely at least four at Cape Ron Lee. Um, but other than that, Gilan, people are looking for them. Yeah. People are definitely looking for them. 
So well, that's very cool. Yeah. That's really yeah. cool. And on the last is actually just a technical question. Are there any metric systems like in place that will be able to assess how many hits, impressions, how this is being, where the impressions are being coming from? So informally, oh. You mean inquiries yeah. to this exhibit? Or, yeah, on the yes. you know, yeah, yeah. site. Right. Um, Xavier Corrubla, my partner in this, um, has done that informally. I think doing it through the Smithsonian channels can present a number of challenges because of security and all the rest of it. But he has tried informally and has found um, a flood of people from South Africa, East Africa, Oman, China. We had somebody from China tell us the other day that one of the cities on the map is, or two cities maybe on the map were incorrect and I totally take full responsibility for that. That's my fault. So there are even though there aren't there aren't ways of, of tracking feedback because there are no comments, this is a, a contained site, um, there are, there are, has already been a tremendous response. And as I keep trying to send it out to colleagues, museum people, academics, all the rest, I think it's gonna um, skyrocket, I hope. So yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Cheers. Thanks. Curious about one thing: the uh, you report that uh, slavery was taking place uh, in South Africa, the capture and sold into slavery into what is now into the uh, India and uh, Asian areas. And in contrast to the slaves that came to the West, to the United States, for instance, we had descendants. You don't have descendants. Um, there are people that are working on this thing right now. There are a number of people, um, colleagues that are Africanists, I can think of, and also um, I, I managed to find out a lot more about this because I know, for example, that there's an Africanist who's working on Indian um, Ocean diasporas, uh, and uh, I don't know that the communities, you know, are, um, you know, there. I, I certainly think that there's been a lot of a marriage, and people have tried to trace. Um, the cultural roots and the cultural sort of um, survivals that have happened in India from East Africa in the same way that, um, you know, Thompson and other people have done with the Americas and, and a lot of people plus, you know, besides him. But I know that um, there's a guy who's at Edinburgh who is working on this very um, topic of the descendants of slaves in Persia um, and he's trying to trace that through um, trance uh, other religious rites, songs, which have linguistic characteristics that you know tie back to um, to to East Africa. So there are people working on it, but you know, slavery in a lot of the Middle East was only outlawed in the 1970s, and it's just not talked about. I mean, it's really, really an absolutely taboo topic. So if you if you imagine that you can't talk about this and it's not a valid question, um, this is part of the trick. I have a dear friend who's a photographer from Lagos. She is teaching in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia now. She's a photography professor. And she, you know, going around Jeddah sees people who look a lot like her. And she asks about them, oh, my sister, you know. And they don't talk about it. It's not a, a community conversation. It's not a question of, you know, even allowing a history to be discussed. And who knows if that's because she's West African and she's trying to broach something that is considered rude or is considered a, a devaluing um, kind of question. But I do think it's taboo in a lot of places, and I do know that also people are trying to work on it. But I think recently, in the past five years or something, that's come up. I would also refer you to the Na uh, New York Public Library has a terrific online site that's not just photography, but has a history of slaves, um, people, migrants, all kinds of different ways that people migrated from East Africa to India, in Indonesia, the Middle East, and you know, some of them went on to become famous generals, you know, rulers. There are all sorts of re um, aspects of the community that are recorded, and that's a terrific um, online exhibition with a Schomburg uh, Center at the New York Public Library. So I highly recommend that too. Um, that's it. One more question, if any. So, so in, in, 
Right. Okay. So in eighteen in the eighteen nineties, basically the way that um, society w was conducted was if you wore uh, if you wore a dark kind of cloth, you were a slave. This was marked for you on the street. You walked around, and so there wasn't necessarily anything to distinguish you. You couldn't count on color or skin to distinguish you as a servant, as a slave. And mind also that there were very significant gradations of slavery and servant and layers and nuances of the language that. Um, I'm not really doing justice to here, um, but it was through the sumptuary laws and the, you know, the um, the bans on certain kind of clothing, on wearing luxurious clothing, that was only the domain of the royals, and it was only the domain. And concubines couldn't wear what a wife could wear, and and you know, you sort of went around in public, and it was all very much about the spectacle of presenting yourself as a royal person. So with that extraordinary um, focus on presenting oneself publicly, that gets completely inverted with the abandoning of slavery. And it's not to say that it ended nicely and everybody just got into their cars and started driving. You know, It was a lot more sort of gradual. But the people that could, the women that could, one of the first things that they did do was choose to cover their head because they were no longer forbidden from doing that by the women or and the men that would own them. You know, Even though they were all Muslim, it was just another sort of layer of sand. Thank you.